You're listening to the Catholic Family Podcast. I'm Kevin Davis. I'm very happy to be joined again for part two of a two-part series from two of my newly formed friends from down in Australia. I've never actually met them, but it's one of the the, uh, good sides of the internet. I can connect and have a podcast with two people from truly across the world over there near Melbourne, Australia. That is Damien and Teresa Arthur. Thank you both again for joining the show. No problem, Kevin. Thanks for having us. Thank and you, we're going to talk about we're going to talk about in this in this part two we want to talk about again continuing on from part one where we're talking about a family culture a Catholic family culture and how they've raised their kids that way but we want to talk about a little specifically in this crazy time and what's going on especially with you know all of the shutdowns and whatnot and how good things have come from from bad enforcements and maybe bad decisions from the local government. And we want to talk about how we got there, perhaps. What what is the psychology that allowed this to happen? The the tyranny and the 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 people following things like sheep. I think that's an interesting topic. But we especially want to keep it light. We don't want to complain. We don't want to make this sound like, you know, woe is me, because honestly, I think we all hear enough of that. So so we're gonna keep it factual we're going to try to say okay what is going on in australia because i see tons of stuff on the internet and i don't know what's true but then we're going to talk about the good things that have come from that and so maybe you both can one of you can explain what is going on in australia well okay look mate um i'm not sure well i've seen some of the mainstream media and what they say about what's going on here but you know some of it's right most of it isn't so because it's mainstream media, so I think we've learned certainly over the last two years, if you haven't learned by now <laughs> that the mainstream media tends to sort of turn everything upside down, then you're probably not paying attention. Um, but, look, it's it's not great, I'll tell you that much. We are, we are built on really a socialist, democratic-type country. I mean, that's kind of the way it's been here for many, many years. We've lived very comfortably. You know, our government's always looked after us. We've trusted them. They've, um, you know, they've got a great healthcare system and all these wonderful things and, you know, uh, welfare for, the, for those that need it. Um, and all in all, you know, it's been pretty good, really. Um, but in the last couple of years, it's, it's all, well, it, it's all kind of gone haywire. But now that we look back and, and we see where we've come from as, a, as an Australian society, we can pretty much see why we are where we are now and it is because of that sort of socialist democratic type of situation where we've allowed ourselves to be governed more and more and more and more to the point where the government is just so big and does so much that it really has just um you know it it has what's the term you said yeah well it really has has well i wouldn't say usurped i'd say that it just has a stronghold on all of us now and we've allowed it to happen because of the boiling frog syndrome where we've just you know we started jump we jumped into a nice cool pool and then now we're basically boiled (laughs) so but um it's not all bad as we'll discuss but it is what it is and you know i don't know what people are seeing uh around the world in terms of of on on the uh their news their mainstream media and everything I'm very close to some of the police here in Victoria, so I do know what's going on with the police. I know there are some absolute psychopathic rogue police out here that are doing horrible things. Yes, the crime, there are crimes against humanity. Yes, the Nuremberg Code from 1947 is just thrown out the window. Even within Australia, some of our own our, our, um, uh, our, our cert- certain acts of parliament are just literally discarded because we do currently, we are now living in a communist regime, certainly for the moment, that's just a fact. Uh, and we've just got to survive as best we can and, and and hope that things turn around. But but even with that, not to sort of, I've been, I've been going on here, not to steal the show, but the truth of the matter is that it's, <laughs> living through it is is actually quite exciting as a Catholic because I think we have a deeper understanding as to perhaps the reasons why. We see it as potentially a, a purge. We see it as hopefully the ruination of, you know, possibly there's this Vatican II beast that it is, this horrible thing. Um, and so we're not necessarily praying for this to end, believe it or not. 
We're praying that great good will come out of it and that ultimately it will be for the glory of God and that we will see many conversions and, um, and, and you know, that, that essentially, yeah, it's, it's happening. We're living through it. But um, it's a great time to be alive because arguably has there been a better time to, I don't know, to, to, to gain merit? I don't know. But I know that we've certainly got our challenges and our opportunities for that. And um, I, I guarantee you that we, within our family group, our friends, um, this is not a this is not a bad this is not a bad situation. We we understand the good that will come of it, and so we are definitely seeing the positives with with what's happening here in Australia right now. Which you know, from a secular or temporal perspective, it's not great, but the temporal sorry the spiritual war is raging, and we are actually seeing fruits from that already ourselves. That's a really good point. I guess I'd ask you before we get into the spiritual side of it. I mean, how how do you think because we just had a podcast, which I think I'll publish shortly before I publish this one, where we talked about the decline of society and how this all happened. And I think we kind of came to the conclusion that that part of it was a slow decline, going away from God, becoming more humanistic. Obviously, that's the biggest problem. And it seems that when you have these ages of decadence and ages of complacency, as you say, things were very comfortable in Australia as they were here and in America as well. When people get complacent, they get comfortable, they stop paying attention, right? They, they, they're they just like, okay, yeah, I'm good. My, my, my life's fine. I've got my car. I've got my house. I've got my Doritos. I mean, and I think that as you see now, as you say, if times get tougher, Maybe we're going to have stronger men from them. It, it literally, even if you're not, ke- you know, keeping out all the spiritual side, maybe, maybe this is going to wake people up to say, "Wow, maybe there's it's going to hit hit a low point where there's actually going to be discomfort around the world where people are, are going to suffer." And as we know, suffering is the only thing that turns many people to God, unfortunately. Yes, and I think a lot of people who are sort of like we want this to be over and to go back to what it was pre-COVID or Let's go back to what was what we had before. We we as Catholics we really need to ask ourselves, was it that good before? Right. And I think all know it was absolutely horrendous. And it still is absolutely horrendous. So it's we we are looking at it as this is something we need to go through as the world needs to go through moving forward to bring the world back to God. And I think that you know, every, we all know that everything that God allows, he brings a greater good out of it if it's not directly good. And I can't see this as any other exercise than God allowing this as punishment for the sins of the world in order to bring people to repentance and conversion. So I think we need to focus on why this is happening and and to realize we don't want to go back because it was not good. We need to go forward and come out of this and put this mess behind us. And yeah, I agree what you said, like suffering indeed is what brings people back to God. And we've already seen some, one of my friends was saying recently that since COVID, the most searched term on the internet has been prayer. I think wow. that's interesting. Interesting. And we've had friends like, well, neighbors mostly, but people weren't really close friends, but people, we acquaintances who, wouldn't really talk much about religion and anything, but since this, they're starting to take, starting to turn to God, and there's potential converts coming on the way, and there actually are actual converts who have happened a lot more since the lockdowns, etc., about 18 months ago than we've ever seen in Australia in such a short period of time, which of course would have a lot to do with the fact that we've got a resident priest mostly here, but we've seen positives already, and. It's easy, you can, people send all these things that seem scary and this is so bad going to happen. And they talk about if we don't stop this now, our children, our grandchildren won't enjoy the freedoms that we've had. And at first you sort of, as a mother, you start to, your first reaction, well, mine was, I almost wanted to start crying about, oh, it's so sad, our children won't have these freedoms that we had. And then I, a second later, realised, well, what did we do with those freedoms? We turned against God and we made a mess. That's what the society did. So maybe those freedoms weren't a good thing because they didn't do good things with them. So maybe our children are going to be better off spiritually and our grandchildren better off spiritually if things are different. 
So we just have to have faith and trust that that God knows what he's doing and he will bring good out of this. And I think there's there's is a really fascinating correlation between, as you say, the people who want to go back to as it was. And I think if you correlate that to the the recognizing resistors, you know, the people who who try to hold on to what was before Bergoglio, you know, before the quote unquote Pope Francis, and they try to go back to that. They even try to go back to, okay, maybe they go back to, to Ratzinger or or past him, they go back to JP2. And it's like, well, no. I mean, yeah, sure, sure, Bergoglio's maybe he's in some ways the worst. He's he's more openly bad and evil and 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 ridiculous. But you know, before wasn't any better. And it's the same with society, as you say. I mean, when was when was our society ever good? And especially if you look in, in in America, I think there were times where America definitely had some morality as a country, but but yeah, it was founded on on unfortunately some principles that were not Catholic and, and some that were directly against God. And so as you say, what what do we want to go back to? But but I think it's a really good point too that that if you look at what's happened in the Nova Sordo, they've completely abandoned their sheep, right? I mean, they they are just like, oh, um, pandemic, we're gone. You know, we're 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 heading to the hills. You all don't get any sacraments. You don't get anything. And I think that's a big reason why we're seeing converts because, well, the, their their quote unquote pastors fled. Yeah, and, and it's a beautiful thing because. Uh, <laughs> Uh, they, um, they, their true colours are showing, mate. This is this is the way it is, and I think it's absolutely sensational that they are showing their true colours for how pathetic they actually are. You know, um, because at the end of the day, if, if it was a true pandemic, and I guess some people think it is, I certainly don't. But um, you know, you would want to be down in that church on your knees, getting the sacraments, preparing for to meet your your Maker, all those things. Um, and, you know, the, as Teresa alluded to earlier, we are seeing here now through this current process, we are seeing people getting on their knees that would make, they weren't doing it two years ago or even 12 months ago. Uh, people praying novenas, you know, people say, praying the rosary. Um, you know, it, it is definitely having a positive effect. People are starting to look at their priorities and to confront themselves and say, well, you know, yeah, I need to actually give some consideration to to, to reality because most of them haven't been living in a real world for, for heaven knows how many long, how many years. Um, but yeah, the Vatican II joke of a church, or I mean, that's just a horrible, horrible thing, um, is showing its true colours, and and that's just fantastic. Well, and, and get this, and this is a, a really good example. Um, we we went to Assisi in Italy, which was a beautiful town. I highly recommend it. Um, but we were we were going to the tomb of St. Clair, uh, who was buried there also in the town. And as you go down the stairs to, to visit her tomb, there's a sign that says, keep your distance, wear a mask and don't pray. I'm not kidding. There was actually a sign that was cro- it was it was someone kneeling down with their hands folded, crossed out. Yeah, no joke that that's truly what it was. They're literally like you're going down. During a pandemic, during a, a, a supposed pandemic, you're going down and you literally are not supposed to be able to pray during a crazy health crisis. So it just shows you. And I, it makes me wonder, maybe the devil and his minions overplayed their hand. Maybe maybe you're starting to see that, that they, they've gone too far. They're waking people up. People are starting to say, whoa, something something is really off. I mean, I mean, if we're going to die, as you say, if we're going to die, um shouldn't I be able to go and kneel down and say a prayer and ask St. Clair to intercede for me with, you know, to God? And, and, and I think that that fact that, that they go so far, you, you start to see the benefits from it. I think you're right. And um, it's interesting because we know that uh, anyone that seriously seeks the truth, they're going to find it. That's just a fact because God will make sure that they do. Um, but what is interesting is, uh, and I guess it's kind of another topic, but in relation to uh, the recent exhortation or whatever Bergoglio calls these things that he these the, the things that he produces, um, where he's basically killing off the the Latin mass, uh, and you know we we've we've sort of discussed this, and it's very interesting that even though their priests are not priests and they so they can't bring our Lord down onto the altar, and and none of us are judging them internally. I mean that's up to God, not us. 
But the fact of the matter is that when they do attend those, you know, quote unquote Latin masses, they're actually saying Catholic prayers. And, you know, Lex Arendi, Lex Credendi, and, and this, I think, is, is one of the things that has come up in our conversations where Bergoglio just, you know, doesn't want that. Well, because Satan doesn't want that, and he's his, you know, he's his right-hand man right now anyway. And so you want to kill off that Latin ma- anything that has a, a real prayer attached to it, anything that could basically um, assist you in corresponding with actual grace needs to be taken out of the picture. So I'm not surprised at all that you've, you've seen signs down there that say don't pray. I mean, that's just that epitomizes the uh, the unfortunate organization that it is. And, and I think and I think you're a great couple to ask this question because I know you went years without a consistent priest and without the sacraments and, and maybe once a month or so. And and I, I think that you'll have an I think people listening to this, perhaps that go to the SSPX or, or other. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> Definitely uh, masses with issues that I mean, we should I'll talk to a priest. We, we've done podcasts with priests about that issue. I don't want to get too far into that. But there's a big issue because they're saying mass in union with the with a false pope, et cetera, of course. And I think one of the issues they'll say is that you cannot. Fulfill a Catholic life or live a Catholic life without the mass and without the sacraments. Now, there's also obviously a deeper issue with with if the sacraments are valid or licit. But I guess I'd ask you to, was that ever a problem it, now during the, the, the crisis or before with not having the sacraments and still keeping your faith? Well, we obviously would never go to a Unicum Mass because we would, we're dead against it because it's offensive to God. But we have found, look, I'll preface it with, we have a great love for the Mass. And if we could, we would go every day. So it's not. We're not you know, against frequent mass by any stretch. We are all for it. But one thing that struck me is when the lockdowns happened, the first thing we were confronted with was you can't go to mass at all. And then the news reports were coming out saying, and you get used to this, it's going to last a long time. This was like March last year. Don't be surprised if in September, October, this is still going. So you're straight away confronted with, Oh no, we're going back to what we had before. We didn't have any mass that regularly, but not at all. You have to work through it, and you realize God won't allow it unless He's going to bring a greater good. And we know that God will provide. All our Lord said, "My grace is sufficient for thee." I think everything goes back to the scriptures, and and if you believe it, which you must, because it's the gospel, you have to trust that it's true. So we just thought, okay, this isn't great, but we. God will provide, and of course, He always does. Then we very soon thereafter had a like an allowance come in where some of the I think some of the maybe the Orthodox Church or some of those bigger churches complained to the government and said we want to be able to live stream, but we need to have altar service, etc. So they gave a permission for, and we found out I think two days before that we could do the whole full Holy Week and Easter with just the essential workers who were required for the live stream. So just there, some people were able to get to Mass when we thought that no one for Mass. So there were maybe a choir, organist, maybe lots of service could go. So that was, you know, roles that you could fulfill. Then it loosened up a bit. Then they brought lockdown again, a more strict one, and they limited the live stream to four people in addition to the priests. So suddenly you've got okay, four people can get to Mass each day, but the priests are priests, you know, organising, rostering different people. He trying to get as many people and limp along in Mass when he could. Then it opened up a bit, and because we also have border restrictions, not just from state to state, but particularly, he, our priest had to go to America, and then it was difficult for him to come back because of the border restrictions. So when he went earlier this year, I think it was end of May, we were all confronted with the reality that, you know, maybe it's not God's will for him to come back. And so we had 
about, I think it was 21 weeks when he was in America where we couldn't get to Mass. And I think it's the longest many of us have gone without going to Mass on the sacraments in our lives. And it was very good in many ways because you have to go through some self-reflection and you ask, why is God allowing this? What am I doing wrong? What can I do better? And I thought in that time, I realized I wanted to get a greater appreciation for the Mass. So I, uh, you know, I'd been listening to an audio book by, I think it's his father, Kearney, some pretty bad thing too, um, Holy Ghost Father, really beautiful book. I thought, no, I'm going to make more of an effort to really appreciate the Mass more. So if and when my priest comes back, I have made an effort to appreciate the Mass more than I have done until now. And then also I decided that we were hoping and trusting he would come back, but there was always in the back of your mind, maybe he won't because you really don't know. And But we were living in open praying and I thought, hey, we don't know how long it's going to be, whether it's going to be, you know, six weeks or months, years. We didn't know. I thought, well, I'm going to start preparing now for my next communion. So I made the longest preparation for communion I've ever made. So that was well, well, I don't know if it's the best, but it was certainly the longest. But it was you learn from these things and you benefit from these things and and you learn when you're in a strict lockdown you've been subjected to here in Melbourne, where we can't leave our homes. We well it's just lifted a little bit today actually, but we can't leave our homes for any more than some essential basic reasons like grocery shopping. We can't visit friends' houses and they can't visit us. And we have a curfew. And we pretty much you you can't do a lot of things. And also we we were deprived of mass to varying degrees, sometimes absolutely and sometimes limited. So as all these things are being stripped from you, you have to ask yourself, you know, why is God allowing this? What good can come of it? What is he? You know, how can we become closer to God and grow in sanctity as a result of this? And what I noticed was, when everything's being taken from you, or at least the prospect of everything is being taken from you, you realize even if everything is taken from you and all you've got left is love of God, then you've got everything anyway. And in fact, you probably have more because all these attachments are being forcibly stripped from you, which you may not have achieved detachment from anywhere near as quickly if it wasn't so forced. So I've found that Looking back, I'm very, very grateful because I feel that it's been a very good thing for myself personally anyway, and I feel that it's, I believe it's been beneficial. And I think I think it's a lot of good has come out of it, and you, you soon realize it's your faith, you've got prayer, you've got love of God. Hang on to those things, and no matter what anyone out there is doing to you or taking from you, they can't take that away from you. And even if, no matter what, they cannot take it away from you. I think and when you realize that, you are free, even if you're constrained, if that makes sense. Yeah, we, we just have to be patient. I mean, like Teresa said, there's so much good that can come of it. And I think that um, God is probably teaching us a lesson. I mean, that's that's kind of my view on it, that, you know, we've we've had it good for, for like three years now. We've actually had a priest where we've had access to the Mass every week. I mean, that hasn't happened here for, you know, decades, really. I mean, that's just a fact. But all of a sudden we have it. We have, we have Father here for, you know, a couple of years. And it sort of reminds me of um, one of the stories – uh, in, in the uh, there's a great book called The Martyrs of the Colosseum. You may have, you may have, you may be familiar with that one. Uh, and in there, I can't remember the dates or the names. I'm pretty hopeless with that sort of thing. But certainly, the story is that you know one of the emperors uh, actually provided a reprieve and and stopped the slaughtering of of the Christians in the in the Colosseum. And within a very short period of time, what did the Christians do? They became lackadaisical, they started partying and they forgot about God and, you know, just like when Moses came down from the mountain, it was it was kind of like that. And so what happened? The, the back out into the Colosseum, off they went again and started uh, getting slaughtered. And so, there's, you know, there's a precedent, there's a lesson there. And al although that's not happening here, the lesson is do not 
you know, do not take it for granted. And and I think that that's a lesson for all of our little group here. That is, is a, a growing little group, but it's still a little group nonetheless. But in terms of, um, like, from my point of view, I suppose, as a father and, and a husband, um, you know, as, as a Catholic, is that when we lost father, it was like well, we just have to crack on. We just have to we just have to look at it objectively. It is what it is. God's allowing it, and we just have to, you know, we we just have to continue. We have to say our prayers, keep Sunday holy, do all the things that that we should be doing to the best of our ability. <clears throat> but what I have found on a personal note is the benefit of it is teaching me personally. It's teaching me patience because um, w- without without well, put it this way: could I could I drive into Melbourne, grab our you know our communist leader by the rip his throat out, stick my hand down? Down his throat, turn his heart off. Well, I'm getting a bit old for that, but uh, the the the, uh, the the spirit is willing. But the fact of the matter is that would have changed. <laughs> <laughs> and so for me, it's like I'm an ex-soldier, so I feel like I want to do something. I want to act. I want to actually get out there. I want to protest, and I want to be you know partake in these things but the truth of the matter is it's going to get us absolutely nowhere and so when you know I, i've tried to say to myself you know what when the going gets tough the, the tough pray <laughs> the tough up. yeah and and so that's been that's been very trying for me on a personal note but it is certainly teaching me patience and i know that when i look at it objectively doing those things going out there I'm not canning people that do it. I'm not going to judge them for doing it because maybe we've all got a role to play. But there's not enough people getting on their knees and praying. So, you know, maybe that's our role. So, you know, I guess, you know, in line with the flavour of this particular podcast, I mean, there's so much positivity that's come out of it, you know, a, a lot, a lot of positivity. Yeah, and I guess if I if I take anything from, from what you both just said, I, I think – there are two points that really stuck out to me. One is to be soldiers of Christ. I mean, to to fight no matter what comes. If it's easier or or hard, you gotta you gotta fight through it. And the other is compromise. We don't compromise. That's so important for anyone listening to this. That that just because things get difficult or more difficult, you have to know what what is true. What is the Catholic Church? And I, I can't recommend that enough to anyone listening to this. Don't. Don't just go by what you see. Don't just go by what looks good. Don't just go to the Latin Mass. We did a whole podcast about that. The Latin Mass isn't enough. It's great. It's a big part of our faith, and it's beautiful, and it is given to us by God, and God comes down for us, and it, 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 there's nothing more beautiful in the world, but it's not everything. You can't you can't compromise and give up all of the other things that the Catholic Church stands for in order just to have the Latin Mass. So please go and go and listen to Father Chicada, Bishop Sanborn, Bishop Piverunas, and and try and try to learn what is the church and what must we believe because I think that's honestly underrated and I think that we, it's it's underrated to the fact that people are willing to compromise just because they they want to to go to church and go to mass even if it's uh, illicit or invalid and I think that that we can't we can't say that enough go talk to a priest um, I, I'll I'll attach my email address to this show. If anyone has any questions about this topic, I will forward it to a priest. If you're in Australia or in America, I have contacts fairly well around the world with priests who I know very well would be very happy to to hear your your questions or your concerns. Because as we've been saying, it, it is the time for 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 proselyte, proselytizing. I think it's, it's it's a time for conversion because people are waking up to the fact that that the world has nothing to offer, nothing, and sure. and. And, and, but that's okay. As we've said, that's that, that's not something to go and cry about. It's not something to mope about. It's something to be okay. We have the church, which offers everything, and that's that's what we should you know take joy from. Well, Kevin, just Kevin. on that, the other thing too is that this again pr- provides a great opportunity um, for the church, like through us, because. We get to be those beacons in this time when other people are freaking out around us. And they're like, you know, oh, and they're giving in. They're going and getting the jab, you know, which is they're giving in. Businesses are sacking people because they're not getting vaccinated. It's like, no, 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 no. We're going to stand firm, come what may, 
uh, God will protect us. And if for whatever reason we have to go through something pretty tough, then we'll just simply have to wear that, accept it, and get on with it. But what we find is that a lot of, you know, the, the people sort of in our area, for instance, along our street that are, you know, secular kind of people, we're getting people contacting us, wanting to come and talk to us and actually wanting to pray with us. Like, where is this coming from? This is just, where is this coming from? And so, um, you know, it, it can only be from the fact that, you know, I guess we are what we are. We don't hide it under a bushel, but we're not out there, you know, banging a drum on the on the, the end of the street. You know, I think that, you know, Rome, Rome was converted not with the sword or anything like that. It was converted by the love that the Christians had for each other and for their enemy. And so, you know, we kind of, we're very fortunate. We have a chance to kind of live that, like in reality right now, not just read it in a book. And so if through this whole debacle of a situation, you know, if one soul, just one soul comes to the truth, then it's going to be all worth it. No matter what, if we lose our business, our house, no matter what, because, you know, that soul is so valuable to God. And, you know, we discuss this with our kids and, and, and they understand this is this is the challenge, but we have to rise to the challenge. And we'll only do that with God's grace anyway, you know. No, it's 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 so true, and and I think that it's as as you mentioned before, it's also exciting. It's it's what we're made for. We're made to suffer. I mean, Christ told us that 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 if we follow Him, we must suffer like Him, and that that that's what Catholics are or should be. And I think if we're not, then as you said before, then we fall into error. We fall into decadence. We fall into idol worship. And and I'm sure I many people listening, you know, fall into the the issues of, of being overly comfortable, being addicted to cell phones, you know, whatever it is. And I think that, yeah, it's time to step to the plate, as you say. And, and, and the good thing is we can't say enough that if you do that, if you step up and say, I'm going to shoulder this cross and this burden, whatever it is, you're so much happier. It's unbelievable. Like, like it's, it's, it's when, when you take on the load, it actually takes off the entire load from, from your, from your soul, because that's, God's will. It's what God wants us to do. And, and people are so unfortunately blinded by by the world, by the devil, by the flesh, that that they don't understand that. And hopefully now, as you say, people are coming to realize that. And and it's our time to show up and 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 uh bring more people to the truth. I, th I think that's I think that's a fair comment. I mean, we're we're in a situation right now, one of our neighbors, um, you know, he's he's a great guy, he's a policeman. You know, we've we've you know we we get on really well and and uh, we've we have discussions about the faith and everything. Well, the last few days, in just the in fact yesterday, yet yesterday, he's been praying novenas. He's been praying the Saint Patrick's breastplate because he had to make a decision on whether he gets this this horrible jab or not. And you know, I, he he's between a rock and a hard place because. The ironic thing about it is that he he went in he's, he's voiced his opinion and said that you know he's done it with um uh, what would you say he hasn't been disrespectful or anything and he said that he doesn't want to get the jab but um here's the irony of it the the morning before he went to get the jab <laughs> he had to get the jab um his his particular department and he's he's a sworn member so he's actually a, he's in the riot police. Um, and so on. And he actually um, had to go and do a small course on human rights. And uh, and part of one of the charters of the human rights is that you can't forcibly have someone partake in, in a medical procedure. Wow. <laughs> and then, wow. And then he has to go, he has to, he's forced to get the jab or he loses his job. <laughs> I might add, in case your listeners don't know, Kevin, about, I think it might have been about two weeks ago, perhaps it was three in the state of Victoria, it was mandated for every worker who leaves their home has to be have the first COVID jab by a certain date and the second one by another date, or you cannot work. So it's virtually wow. gotten to that level. And, and there is like, you know, $500,000 fine to employers if they don't ensure that their employees have all had the jab. Mm -hmm. So they're really getting to the bully tactics. So this particular friend was you know confronted with that other friends we know who aren't catholic just neighbors have taken time off work 
and they use a lot of people are using the buffer zone of savings that they have but most people don't actually have any buffer zone of savings and need to actually get income in to pay the next mortgage or rent so it's really been unbelievable what's suddenly fallen on the entire state which is a big state and in you know just that's it just well the whole flavor is it, it makes you think you know where's it going and how, how do you deal with it <clears throat> and you know one of the things that i've had to sort of work through is to say you know we have to presume and let's hope it doesn't come to this but we have to presume that they're going to get to the point where they're going to come into your house and actually vaccinate you and your children whether you like it or you don't so that's that's where we are at i mean that's that's where this is actually going and, and it may not run its course but then again it may and so you know one thing so okay i'm the father i've got these children here the last thing i want is to see my kids get jabbed um i really don't want the thing either because all the evidence that we've seen shows that there are major issues with it but you know do you protect how do you protect best protect your family in that situation and you think well i can arc up when they come in and they'll take me out and you know i will aim to take out two of them with me so there'll be three body bags and that's wonderful however however that's not going to help my family at all so because the last thing i want is my children to be in foster care and you know and i don't even want to go into that i don't want to think about that so they still need their father to to protect them and secure them so we would actually have no alternative at that point than to roll up our sleeves get that thing and tell them to get the heck out of our house but i'll tell you the one thing that we would never ever do mate because this is the grain of incense and we will we will take the shot between the eyes if we have to or however they want to do it but no one in my family will sign a consent form never that's the grain of incense mate so you know we've thought about it and we've prayed on it and come what may if god allows it bring it on um we hope it doesn't come to that but we are prepared because we just have to be so yeah it's 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 crazy times but um but you know to do a 360, as we said earlier, it's a great opportunity, seriously great opportunity. Well, and I think that we need to, as as Catholics, the Catholic Church being, of course, universal and united together on this earth and in, and in purgatory in heaven, that we need to pray for, for you in, in, in Australia and, and pray that it's a good outcome and, and also pray for ourselves and know that if it can happen there, it can happen anywhere. And um, of course, here in Germany, it's also a very social democratic state, which has a very, very powerful government. Sounds very much like Australia. And and um, yeah, I, I think that um, it could be coming down the pipe for us, too. And and if that's the case, we all need to support each other with prayers and, and, and more so for for the strength to be able to stand up for what we need to do for for what god wills for for to happen and maybe not even to say to pray against that to happen but to pray that we have the strength to um to persevere in our faith and in our convictions because it's yeah it, it could get really tough here and and we need all the help we can get so anyone listening please pray for australia and pray for pray for the whole world i mean that's if anything, I, I, these last two podcasts, or last I should say five podcasts, I suppose that if it's opened my eyes to the fact that the the world is nothing, and and boy, we have to just pray and and pray that we're ready for whatever the world's going to throw at us, and and hope that that uh yeah we we reach eternity because it's it's it, it could it could be the next years are, are are not a fun time. I guess we'll 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 find out. Yeah, we will find out. But look, mate, just on that, um, firstly, it's. You know, we don't feel alone down here. We really don't. And we don't want to paint a picture of, oh, who are we's us? It's like, no, look, look, you know what? Bring it on. We'll, we'll just have to deal with it. And we've got God on our side. And if we've got God on our side, we don't need anything else. But we certainly have that sense of, you know, the mystical body and, you know, the church militant. We, we, we're fortunately well connected. Um, and so there are prayers going around the globe like there's no tomorrow. Um, that's a fact. But I, I mean, I can tell you from a personal note that the my my concentration of prayer has really increased on one particular request, and that is just simply, God, what do you want me to do? Like, you know, and the the answer that I feel that I keep getting right now is to just keep doing what we're doing, you know, 
um, and to to not lose faith and trust. That's sort of the key thing that I feel that I'm being told. I don't need to go out there and protest and do all those things, as I said earlier. That's the answer that I keep getting. Just, you know, hold, hold the line, as they say, stay stay strong in the faith and, and try to be that beacon where we can because if this is about bringing other souls back, then it's a great opportunity to be a part of that, you know. So we don't feel alone in any way. Um, we have, you know, we have, we know that we have friends all around the world, friends that we don't even know, but we're all praying for each other because it's all part of the economy of grace and God will distribute it as he sees fit. So, um, so, but you know, it's, and it, but it's great to, to know that and to, uh, and even to meet people like you, mate, this is the first time we've spoken too. Uh, exactly. Yeah. And take, take, take what we can from it and, 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 and yeah, do the best we can and try to enjoy life as we can. And that probably means getting out of the world as much as possible. And I think that that's, that's a good place to end. I don't know if either of you have, have final words on it. I think it's been a, I've, I've greatly enjoyed it. I hope our listeners did as well. Um, it's, I think it's been a really interesting conversation for, for both parts of the show, talking about how you guys have raised your kids and tried to build a family that, that puts God first and how you try to do the same now in, in, in a crazy chaotic time. And I think that that's in the end, your, your family motto is, is, should be a, 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 at least a part motto, you know, maybe not everyone's family motto, but it should be part of everyone's home that, 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 that put God first and, and, and everything else will follow after. So if, uh, I don't know if you guys have last words. Just a couple of things since you asked. Please. Our secondary motto is all things work together unto good for those who love God, which obviously fits in with the first. And I just would like to say to any listeners who may be confronted with a similar situation coming into wherever they are living, that I know I'm probably stating the obvious, but it's something that's really been on my mind a lot is we have to really call to mind that we have an infinitely good God and he therefore wants what's good for us. And he's also all powerful. So no matter what circumstance you might be in or be confronted with going into probably or possibly, you needn't fear. We, like There was no need to fear because the good and all powerful God who wants what's best for you will provide for you. And even if it seems on the surface, oh, this is terrible. We can't get to mass. We don't need to fret because God wants what is good for us because he is so good. And we don't need to worry. So I think that's really important is for us to focus on, on that because there is too much fear in the world right now. And that's obviously never a good thing when it's not a fear of sin. We should, you know, like fear sin and nothing else. So that's my little ending preaching little remark. <laughs> yeah, look, my, my, my final comment would be, firstly, thanks very much for having us on. We really appreciate it. Uh, and um, and we hope it's, I don't know, assisted some way uh, for, for your listeners. Um, but I would just say, in closing, uh, that it's really important as parents and especially as the father to be positive around your entire family during such a period when when that you are challenged and you know it's it's kind of and you have good days and you, and you have the days that are, are very challenging, especially um, in business and things like that, where our our business, for instance, our key customer base throughout Australia that industry has been closed for 260 days. And so, you know, we're just trying to make ends meet. But you know what? Every single time I think, you know what, it's over. Our, our business is gone. We've put everything into this thing and it's obviously not what God wants. Do you know what? Just bang, something happens, whether it's an order from overseas or just something left field happens every single time. And I say to myself, Damien, why do you doubt? Why do you have doubt? Are you a little faint? Yes, I am. That's true. Totally weak. To totally, totally weak. Um, so that's a reminder. So, but I, I just want to finish off by saying, especially to the dads, you know, no matter what, be positive. You know, um, the last thing you want to do is have your kids feel that they don't have that security, that you, you're not there for them. And by being positive throughout a process such as this, this I think it can really help a lot. And it helps us too, helps us blokes as well, you know, to rise above things. And we've got, if we put God first and we show our children that that is the case, then, um, you know, all will be well. 
Perfect. Damien, Teresa, thank you so much for being part of the show. I've really enjoyed it. I, I think believe you guys still do podcasts, at, at least at times, over at truerestoration.org. Um, fantastic. Cannot recommend it enough. As I've said many times, True Restoration is the big leagues. They're, they're the NFL, and, and we're high school football over here on Catholic Family Podcast. Uh, we, I listen to them all the time. They're, they're really fantastic, fun, enjoyable, but extremely educational. So I'll attach a link to that. Uh, you got to go sign up help them out support good media i cannot stress that enough in this time that if we're going to have media let's try to make it good media and true restoration is as good as you're going to get 